What's going on citizens of the Dark Knight Nation and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be breaking down, discussing, and analyzing Radiant Black number one by Kyle Higgins and Marcelo Costa. Now this has been a really big prospect in the indie comic space, sort of the new generation Spider-Man, or at least that's how it's been heralded by many. Obviously a lot of folks have been excited, so I look forward to talking about this with you guys. I want to ask that if you enjoy this video, please make sure to leave a like down below, comment letting me know your thoughts on Radiant Black, why you picked it up, why you might not have, so on and so forth. And of course subscribe down to the channel for more content like this. Another great easy way to help out us small channels is to hit that share button. and. Uh, Put this in front of people you think might enjoy it because the more eyes on this stuff, the more opportunities I will have to be able to do more for you guys. I also want to let you guys know that I actually penned a really cool sci-fi noir comic book called Area 51 The Helix Project of which the second issue's Kickstarter is live right now. Click the link in the description below to go check that out. It includes a bunch of cool released art with the original and variant covers, super sweet exclusive merchandise, obviously promotional interior art as well. Uh, and uh, a cool little dramatic trailer that you can check out. There are also plenty of opportunities for you to be able to snag issue one in this Kickstarter campaign, just in case you need to catch up. But uh, we'll talk about that later. With all of that out of the way, let's get into this video. The premiere issue of Radiant Black opens up with our protagonist, Nathan Burnett, just as his life reaches rock bottom. With $40,000 in debt and about $50 to his name, we find him on the phone begging for a loan. We learn that he's a struggling writer that moved out west to find opportunity and all he needs is a break. But of course, he wouldn't be the proper Spider-Man analog without a scuffle with failure. So he's turned down for not having a necessary debt to income ratio, even after making a point about how he wouldn't need the loan if he just had a decent income. Just one week later though, we pick back up with Nathan in Lockport, Illinois, moving home with his parents. Overwhelmingly supportive parents at that. Rather than berate him for his career choice or what have you, the Burnett's remind him of how difficult being a writer can be as a career and that they're proud of him for reaching high and most importantly, that it's his calling. The show of parental infection was promptly interrupted by his childhood friend Marshall. Not having seen each other in quite some time, Marshall takes him out for a drink, and after learning about Nathan's rough situation, does what friends do and badgers him because of it. Nathan affirms that there's a big time agent waiting for him to finish his novel and success will make its way around to him in a matter of time. This is where he admits that his parents have no idea about the deep financial hole he's dug for himself and uh, it's followed by another rousing round of Marshall taking some friendly jabs. We cut into the near future now as Nathan guides an absolutely plastered Marshall back to the car. But before they can manage to get inside, the pair notice a suspicious glowing object floating not too far away. Whatever this thing is, it's undoubtedly caught their attention. Nathan reaches out with four fingers, might I add, to the miniature black hole, and before he can register what's going on, it merges with him, rematerializing as some sort of spacesuit. Somewhere between the flashing lights, alcohol, and the otherworldly experience, our hero to be finds himself puking on the side of the railroad. This is when two local police officers arrive to the scene to see what's going on. This is where Marshall makes a mess of things as he attempts to cover their tracks and claim that they're First Amendment auditors, which leads into an inevitable argument with the officer. In the calamity of it all, somehow Marshall doesn't notice the bright light or the blast of train's horns as it comes barreling toward them. In a fit of desperation, Nathan manages to tap into the power of the black hole and selectively eliminate the gravity around not only the police, but the nearby train, saving them from what was their impending danger. Before the cops can regain their footing, Nathan and Marshall rocket away from the scene. We pick back up with these two atop a grain storage tank in what looks like a plantation. Nathan struggles to try and remove the helmet from the costume, but comes up short, radiating with anxiety. Before things can get catastrophic, Marshall recalls how Nathan mentioned that his powers seem to manifest simply when thought about, so he suggests that Nathan just think about taking off the cowl. After a short outburst, Nathan reflects for a moment and admits that he'd lied about the opportunity waiting for him in California. Truth is, there's no big time agent waiting for this book. Apparently a while back, there was somebody willing to give him a chance, but after four years, he doesn't have so much as a single chapter. He considers the fear and the anxiety of finding out that he wasn't good enough, but now that he has this suit, these powers, he feels an obligation to do something with it. Great power, great responsibility, you know the shtick. 
We cut to somewhere in Chicago as the issue comes to a close, and as the camera pans up, we cut to somebody in a red variation of the same radiant black costume, with a duffel bag full of cash in hand and a wake of destruction left behind them. All right, so overall I have to admit that I let other folks' excitement sort of blur my vision going into this story, and I really thought that uh, it was going to be the next huge thing right off the bat. And while this by no means was a bad issue, I had high expectations going into this. And so let me let me sort of outline uh, a little bit about what's working and what's not working. Um, I did think that there was a, a, a very prudent commentary made uh, in the story that, that was both brief but punchy about the distribution of wealth and how the loan system is basically in place to help the rich get richer as opposed to giving money to those who might need it. Uh, and and it, that's also used very well to build up the personal drama for, for Nathan Burnett. You know, the, there's this relatable setup and you feel for him when he breaks down after receiving the news, uh, which is made even more uncomfortable because we then learn that he was actually on the way to pick up Uber passengers and they walk in on him having a full-blown meltdown, uh, which is both depressing, funny, and weaves in a bit about this character. And I thought that particular moment was just a great example of how to economize page space. And it also does a little bit of foreshadowing, right? Because on the phone, he lies to the loan agent and says, oh, I'm on, I'm on the way to go meet that editor, but he's actually, you know, Ubering kind of pokes at the fact that he might not be telling the truth, which you learn about later on. This issue also had a lot of dialogue, but it's well done dialogue and it weaves in exposition really well. It has a nice organic cadence that makes each of these speakers, each of these cast characters feel individual, which is really nice. You know, there there is that sort of first issue tendency that I talk about where writers will just give you blocks of text, whether it's an internal monologue or, or they'll really, really clunk up the dialogue in order to get this information across. Um, and although there was a lot of dialogue, I give Kyle Higgins a lot of credit because he was able to weave in the information that we needed, both on, a, on, a, on an emotional contextual level and on a sort of physical contextual level. And like I said, it reveals a lot about character. So it, it, it doesn't become this sort of overly obvious or forceful way to, to communicate information. So, you know, well done. Another sort of back and forth comment is that not a lot really happens in this issue, uh, but it's a first issue. Higgins and Costa put in plenty of work to identify their protagonists, the supporting cast, and give us a cause to connect with them. Obviously, I brought up, you know, the, the sort of very personal tension that, that Nathan has, but I like the, the chemistry between Nathan and Marshall. It's very believable. I'm interested to see how this develops. I begin to wonder what this might mean for tensions moving forward. Um, you know, a, a, a lot of sort of hypothetical questions are posed by this relationship in a, in a very sort of implicit way. Regarding the art, I think Marcelo Costa is a much better colorist than he is a penciler. He lays down a lot of really good gradations of tone to provide depth, but when you look at the sort of line work and the design work, um, per, it, it, it does kind of fall flat for me, and you can see how he begins to save himself with color. And I, and I do want to give particular note to the way he uses uh, palette. In specific, while they're in the bar, you know, it has a good sense of atmosphere in that moment. I have particular issues with what Marcelo Costa is doing with relative perspective. There are scenes where Marshall and Nathan sometimes look like hobbits <laughs> if they're like, you know, more than five or six feet away from the camera. Uh, and the poses and acting can feel a bit rigid at times and it begins to sort of work against the 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 tone of the story or at least the impact of particular moments and it does that sort of in tandem with the fact that i feel like the camera could have been more dynamic with with those more climactic shots you know if, if costa 
would vary his angle level a little bit or a little bit more dramatically in moments of impact, it would have brought the visual storytelling to the next level. It is slightly saved by the fact that I feel like Costa has a good sense of what visual storytelling beats need to be presented in the shot. But again, you know, when a character doesn't feel kinetic and when the camera isn't able to accentuate the moment in the way that 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 visual beat needs, it does begin to bring things down a little bit. And a particular example is, is the moment where we first see Nathan fully suited in the in the radiant black costume. There's not a lot of presence to that moment. And I, that moment needed to be big for me. And I felt like it wasn't. And I think a couple simple things could have fixed it. One being camera angle. I think if we had a much sharper, lower camera angle, it would have given um, radiant black a little bit more presence in the scene. You could have done more with the sort of energy effect, perhaps, uh, and, and maybe done a little bit with the light sourcing you know, to show it emanating a little bit more onto the surrounding environment. I don't know, that's just sort of spitballing here. What I will say is that I feel like the art kind of improves as the book goes on. Uh, and there are moments where the facial expressions do carry a lot of emotion and information. So overall, you know, the, the story has a lot of promise based off of this first issue. Uh, it, it's certainly not perfect. Uh, I, I did go into it expecting a little bit too much based on the hype, which is my own fault. I think Higgins presented a pretty interesting spin on the coming-of-age Spider-Man archetype. And that down the line, there's very much the potential for it to become its own own thing and have its own identity i'm gonna have to give this one a 7.75 out of 10 but obviously it's only the first issue so there's a lot of possibility to be had in general there's a lot of solid execution in dialogue and and, and in the particular emotional setup for nathan burnett obviously i had a few issues with uh costa's art in terms of you know shot setup uh whether it be this the sort of angle and composition of the shot uh, and, and the lack of presence and, and of course like you know sort of some relative perspective issues um, but it, it certainly wasn't bad there are certain moments that won me over I look forward to seeing Costa growing as an artist I do want to pick up these next two or three issues a couple of things to look out for one of which being how this differentiates itself from its influences and builds its own mythology and cast of characters that are unique uh, in and of to this series. So I look forward to checking out issue two. Do you like comics? Yeah, I like comics. Libby, do you like comics? Yeah. Good enough. Corny joke aside, I really want to encourage you guys to check out the link in the description below to the second issue of my comic book, Area 51 The Helix Project. The Kickstarter campaign is live now and I would love for you to join us. There are so many great rewards and opportunities. Obviously, picking up signed copies of this issue and the prior issue, as well as cool custom-designed merchandise being drawn into the book. Wow! And a number of other things, so please, please, please consider pre-ordering, picking up a copy of the book. And again, if you didn't pick up issue one, plenty of opportunities there for you to grab it along with issue two. And if you can't financially contribute, sharing goes a really long way. So please consider doing that as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to grab your copy of Area 51 The Helix Project or to find a new comic book shop to frequent, think about checking out AJ's Comics in Colchester, Connecticut. They're my local comic book store and uh, somewhere that I spend more money than I probably should as broke college kid writing comic books. But you get 10% off everything in this store if you sign up for your comic book pro list. It can all be managed online and if you live overseas on a United States military base, you're still eligible for free shipping, which is awesome. So check them out, link to their website down below, and they are an official retailer of Area 51 The Helix Project. So if you want to grab a copy through them as well, feel free. I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll catch you guys on the next video from Dark Knight Nation.